14. If you look at that chapter, and the subject this evening is the mark of the beast and the work of the unholy trinity. The unholy trinity. You know, the, the holy trinity is the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The holy trinity. Well, there's an unholy trinity as well, and they're mentioned in this chapter. Revelation 13 and verse number 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. This is John, the Apostle John, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Revelation is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals Him. And so Jesus Christ is literally the one speaking through the Apostle John. But John is speaking as a human. This is what he saw. I don't know how to explain it all. One day we'll understand it all. But John just wrote down what he saw. Now we can use other scripture to help us understand what, what John saw meant. But let's just read the chapter first. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That is three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in, the, in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of and the faith of the saints. He goes on to say, And I, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So where did the first beast come from? The out of the sea. Now he sees a beast coming up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number 
is 600, three score, and six. What's three score? 60. 666. Six, six. The number of the man is six. God's number is seven. It's always one more. It's perfect. The number of perfection. But that's the classic chapter in the New Testament on the identity of the unholy trinity. So in the last message, we briefly discussed the coming Antichrist and his characteristics and his work. And we noted that the Apostle John said, Little children, it is the last time as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. There are many Antichrists in the world today, all movements and men who are against our Savior are Antichrists, but they're not the Antichrist. Let's notice that there is a coming Antichrist. He will be a person. He will be a man just like Christ was a man. And when the Word of God speaks of the Antichrist, it always uses the masculine pronoun, he. He is a man. When will the Antichrist appear? We learned last week that he'll appear when the church has been raptured and the Holy Spirit has been taken away. Reading in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 7, the scripture says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. We learned in the King James when it uses the word let, it means to hinder. He who now hinders, it says, will be taken out of the way. And that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And then it says, shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we know how the Antichrist ends, but he will be a man. He will appear sometime after the rapture of the church when the Holy Spirit is taken away because every child of God is possessed by the Holy Spirit and when every child of God is taken out at the rapture, then the Holy Spirit will not be here to hinder evil. It will not be here to, to, he will not be here to hinder the wicked one and that's when the Antichrist will come on the scene. After the, the Christians have been raptured, the Spirit taken, then the tribulation will begin on the earth. The tribulation, as we learned, is that period of time when the world is judged by God because they rejected His Son, Jesus. The terrible plagues which will come upon the earth are described in Revelation chapters 6 through 18. So if you have time this week, read those chapters and you'll read about the plagues that will take place on this earth. We learned that it will be a time of tribulation like as the world has never seen. And this world has seen some tribulation, hasn't it? But it'll be worse than anybody's ever seen in this world that will take place. And it'll be because people have rejected Christ. In the forefront during the tribulation time, there will be three unholy people. All three of them were mentioned in chapter 13. The first one we heard about was the dragon. The dragon. Who is the dragon? It says, verses 2 and 4, And the dragon gave him his power, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So he's the one who's giving the power. The dragon is none other than old Satan. Satan is the dragon. He is the infernal enemy of Christ and of every believer. He is your worst enemy, Satan is. And he is alive and well on planet earth as the great Hal, uh, was this Hal Linden? Lindsay, Hal Lindsay. He wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And in that he gives a good description of old Satan and his agenda for the world. But he's the, the infertile enemy of Christ. All of sin and sorrow that we see today is because of him. All that will come upon the earth will be because of him. In the tribulation, Satan will make his last stand 
against God. And it amazes me every time I think of that. Because Satan knows already that he's defeated. Do you know anything about Satan, where he came from? Isaiah tells us that he was an exalted angel. He was the exalted cherub, like God's right-hand man. And the book of Isaiah said that he was lifted up with pride. And he said, I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. And so basically he tried to um, take over heaven. And he, he basically took a third of the angels from heaven with him. And they became his emissaries, his demons. And they are powerful. And he doesn't take any prisoners. And he uses them in a very wise and crafty way. And even when he can't be in our lives, his demons are in our lives. And we have to be aware of that. But he's the dragon. Uh, all, he will choose a man to be his representative. He will give to that person great power. We know that person as the Antichrist. The devil is God's enemy. He is every Christian's enemy. He is the enemy of all righteousness. He is the author of sin, suffering, and death. Why did Adam and Eve sin in the garden? They were tempted by whom? The serpent, which was Satan. All right? Though Satan has great power, Christians can defeat him today because we have who living in us? God, the Holy Spirit, lives in us. The book of James says in chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's what the Bible says. Resist him, and he will flee from you. You know, the scriptures say that the demons tremble at his name. They tremble at the name of Jesus because they know He is more powerful than they are. And listen, He lives in you if you're saved. You can't say like Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil never makes you do anything. He will tempt you. And He knows the best way to do it too. He knows where all the chinks in our armor are. And and, that's the way He tempts us. He doesn't tempt us to do something that we wouldn't actually be tempted to do. He knows what our weaknesses are. Think about it. He's been around since the beginning. He's seen man in every state. He's very powerful in that sense. Temptation has taken many a person down because they yielded to it. But here's good news. You don't have to. It says resist the devil and he will what? See, Christ showed us the way when He resisted temptation Himself. In Matthew chapter 4, when he was in the desert and the devil himself tempted him. And how did Jesus defeat the devil? With the word. Every time the devil tempted him, he said, as it is written, as it is written, as it is written. And that's the same way you and I can defeat the devil with the word. Just quote the Bible to him and and you will defeat him. Okay, The end of Satan is plainly given in scriptures. First, we find that he will be bound during the kingdom age. That is, during the millennial reign of Christ. It's given to us in Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil. That's how I know that the dragon is, is the devil. He's called that there the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him to the bottom of his pit and shut him up and set a seal upon it that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So that is the the, the, the first set of judgments against him. During the millennial reign, after Christ comes back at the battle of Armageddon and establishes his kingdom on this planet, the Bible teaches us here that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. Why? What's significant about 1,000 years? 
That's how long the millennial reign of Christ is. The kingdom, the millennial kingdom, it'll be on this earth, not in heaven. It'll be on this earth where Jesus himself will rule and reign out of Jerusalem for a thousand years. And if you're saved today, the Bible teaches you'll come back with him and you'll probably have a job or two to do during that millennial reign. But he'll rule the world with the rod of iron and he'll rule in righteousness. And Satan will be hooked up in prison for a thousand years. Now, the eternal doom of Satan. See, what, what happens when he's loosed? When he's loosed out of, out of that thousand year prison, uh, he will actually amass another force who will go against God. And they'll be destroyed with the voice of God and with, with the light they'll be destroyed but his eternal doom is mentioned in verse 10 of chapter 20 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet prophet are and shall be what tormented day and night forever and ever how many of you thought that satan was in charge of hell have you ever heard anybody teach that Satan is in charge of hell. If you go to hell, he's going to be there with that pitchfork and he's going to be sticking you all through eternity. No, he's not going to be in charge of hell. God created hell. He did. God created hell for the devil and his angels. And it's never God's intent or desire for people to go there. That's why I sent the Lord Jesus to die for us on the cross of Calvary. So that we could have eternal life and not, and not perish, as John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish. So if I don't believe in him, what will happen? I will perish in hell. I will be in hell for all eternity. A fire that will never be quenched. The Bible says where their worm dieth not, whatever that means. But for all eternity, those who reject Christ will spend that in hell and they'll be tormented along with Satan. And I believe that the Bible is pretty clear also that there are degrees of punishment in hell. And I think that Satan will probably get the most. So that's the first character in the unholy trinity, the dragon. Who is he? Satan. The second character is called the beast verse 13 verse uh, uh, chapter 13 verse 1 and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy this is the one to whom the devil gives power and authority this beast is the Antichrist. Again, he is a man, a human, that is given supernatural power by whom? Satan. Satan. So the dragon is the one who gives him his power and his authority. Uh, note the origin of the beast. It says he will rise up out of the sea. The sea is typical of the Gentile nations. The particular sea in mind is doubtless the Mediterranean, for it's in the center, so to speak, of the former Roman Empire. Now the ten horns are a further mark of identification, showing that the Roman Empire is referred to, not as it has been during the entire existence, but as it shall be known in its last form. The Old Testament prophet Daniel uh, describes the nations and the history throughout the century. Uh, Rome was a very strong nation, but morally it was very weak, and Rome fell. That Rome fell, but the Bible speaks about a revived Roman Empire. And so uh, seven heads refers to seven hills or seven mountains. What's the city of the seven hills? Rome. Rome. And then it says 
The seven heads, they symbolize different forms of government in which the Roman Empire has existed from its beginning to the end. Verse 3 speaks of the restoration of the Roman Empire when it will be a federated empire of ten kings. Thus the ten horns, they show that the Roman Empire is referred to not as it has been, but it, as it will be. The ten horns have ten crowns. What does a crown represent? A king, so it's referring to ten kings, a ten-nation confederacy that's bound in the, in the form of the Roman Empire, a revived Roman Empire. The beast will be a warlike person because the word says, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? He will be a blasphemer. Uh, it says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. The Antichrist will no doubt be an atheist. He will set himself above all that is called God and will cause the people to worship him. The beast as set forth before us in Revelation 13 is the dragon's masterpiece. Satan has always wanted to have people to worship him. He even wanted Christ to worship him. There in Matthew chapter 4, when he was up on the pinnacle of the temple, he said, you know, look at all this. I'll give it to you. All you have to do is worship me. I'll give you the whole world. All you have to do is worship me. And of course, God, came, uh, Jesus came back uh, and it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Uh, and so that's the second character. Verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So the, the, the idea here is that Satan knows that if he came in his own form, men would not worship him. So he comes in the form of a man. Does that sound similar to, to anything? How, how did God come to earth? In the form of a man. Jesus. Satan is the great imitator. He wants to be like God. And so he's trying the same thing. The beast is empowered by Satan. And the idea is so, so he will cause all men to worship him. Then the third character is the false prophet. The third member of the unholy trinity. The false prophet will be a man. Just like the beast. Is proven by the doom of the false prophet as given in Revelation 19.20. It says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The first beast came out of the sea, the second beast or the false prophet comes up out of the earth. If the sea symbolizes the Gentile nations, the earth possibly symbolizes Israel. The false prophet, as he is called, may be a Jew. May or may not. Uh, I've heard some identify him as a Roman Catholic because it comes from Rome but, or a pope. Uh, but uh, it seems to indicate that he may be a, a Jewish uh, heritage, uh, while the beast before whom he exercises his power may be a Gentile. He comes from a Gentile nation. The first beast will be a dictator, a world ruler. The second beast will be something like a religious leader, and he'll perform wonders, great miracles. And he'll cause the people to worship the beast. The main business of the false prophet is to support the beast. He will be the absolute tool of the first beast. Verse 7 gives a summary of his work. Uh, I mean, there are seven verses. Verses 12 to 15. It says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Some commentators don't believe that's literal. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I mean, if, if you were smitten with a sword and, and it was a deadly wound, 
but you survived that wound, would it not make people think that you were supernatural if you could survive that wound? It, it keeps repeating that over and over in the passage here. It says, And he doth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Can you just imagine what that will look like? Here's an image that they make, an inanimate image, and he has power to make that image speak. It causes many people to worship the image and the beast. There's a movement even today afoot, signs and wonders. Uh, it's a sign, signs and wonders uh, type ministry. People place more emphasis on the miracles and the signs and wonders than they, than they place on Jesus himself. We're never meant to worship miracles. Miracles were given for the purpose of, of authenticating the messenger. That's why the early uh, uh, apostles were given miracles. That's why you saw miraculous things happen in the book of Acts. It was the beginning of the church age. And they were to convince people that, hey, this is the real deal. And again, Satan, the great imitator, is trying the same thing. People will follow a miracle maker like him. In the tribulation days, it will be either worship the beast or starve. Listen to what it says in Revelation 13. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. This evil one, this uh, false prophet, what will he do? He will exercise the power of the Antichrist, causing all the world to worship the first beast. He will perform great wonders and bring down fire from heaven in the sight of all men. Again, he is not receiving worship. He wants everybody to worship the first beast. That's his job. He will deceive earth dwellers by the means of all these miracles. He will cause people to make an image that looks like the beast, set it up in the actual temple, and it will speak. And he will cause everyone to receive a mark. What will that look like? I don't have a clue. It says count the number. It may be the number 666. It may be another mark of identification, but everyone will have that mark. If you don't take the mark, you won't eat. So you'll die. Likewise, if you don't worship the beast, you will be hunted down and killed. And there will be many who trust Christ during that time. And they will pay for it by giving their life as martyrs. All men, both small and great, rich and poor, will be forced to receive this mark in their right hands or in their foreheads. And nobody's going to be able to buy and sell. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Six. Six, six. Now many have tried to figure out the meaning of that number. I mean, through the years, people have taken, you know, prominent individuals and they've, uh, they've taken their, the letters of their name and they found out what numerical, what number correspond to that letter. And they've added those numbers up and if it was 666, they were quick to say he could be the Antichrist. I remember Henry Kissinger they said his name was 666. There was just a long list of prominent people in the world that had done that. But I'll tell you, uh, I don't think anybody will know. They won't, know. they won't know until he's already on the scene. But I, do, I believe they will know. Dr. William Newell says that God will give full understanding to his saints in the tribulation whenever it's needed. The saints of the church age, like you and me, will not be here. But there will be tribulation saints 
who worship not the beast and they won't receive the mark because they know what it's about. They will know and understand this man. His number will be very plain to them for it is the number of a man. Now many people have tried to arrive you know, at this mysterious number. Uh, they, uh, putting aside vain gas, guesses, we know that six is the utmost reach of man. Man was created on the sixth day. God's great human opponents have been marked by the number six. Goliath was six cubits in height. His spear's head weighed six shekels, and it had six pieces of armor. Nebuchadnezzar's image was 60 cubits high and six broad. There were but a few of the six, that's just a few of the, of the sixes that attached themselves to this man. In light of the tragic days ahead, well, before I get there, I want to go back and just look at one thing and just call it to your attention. It says in reference to, let's see, verse 2, chapter 13, verse 2, talking about the Antichrist. It says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. You know what's significant about those things? Yeah, it, it points back to Daniel's prophecy about an image. That image was made up of different animals. And so the lion represented Babylon in all of its glory. The bear represented the nation that defeated Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the bear. And then the leopard represented Greece, Alexander, Great, Alexander the Great. And so those three animals are listed here in reference to the Antichrist. That's why also we think that he's referring to a revived Roman Empire because that's the next, the next empire that arose after Greece was Rome. And so you can go back and read, and we'll, we'll look at this again you know, when we get there. I didn't want to you know, put too much on your plate tonight. But the, the idea in this message was to introduce you to those three unholy people that will be uh, revealed in the tribulation period. So in light of the tragic days ahead in this world, there are two things we should do. First, we should rejoice in our own salvation in the fact that we're going to escape the terrible things that are coming upon this earth. This world is not going to get better. You know that, don't you? It's not going to get better. Don't expect it to get better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Let's rejoice that we know where we're going, that we have a relationship with Christ, and that we will escape the tribulation period. But then secondly, we ought to endeavor with all of our power to bring as many to Christ as we can. Because there's so many who are ignorant of these things. There's so many who believe that the power to sustain is in the government. That we just need the right people in office. There's never going to be a right person in office until Jesus is there. There's some good men and some not so good men. But the one who we need to truly pray for is for Jesus to be on the throne. This is the time to win people before the darkness settles upon the earth. We have darkness now. John said the Antichrists are already in the world. But the Antichrist has not been revealed yet. And you know, he's, he's a human being. And if you believe in the imminent return of Christ, that is, that he could come at any time for his church, that means he could come today, right? All right, if he came today, then the Antichrist is already living. The man is already living. He may not know it. He might, may not have been empowered by, the, by Satan yet. But if Christ could come back today, Antichrist is already living on the scene. He's not going to be created. It's going to be a person. It behooves us to be observant of the times. To be observant to people's needs. And opportunities that God places right in front of us to show people Christ. God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you today for the way you love us. 
We thank you for the privilege we have to be in a family together. There's so many things we don't know. I pray that, Lord, we would focus on the things that we do know, that we might see how very important it is to do your work while it is yet day, for the day comes when no man shall work. Help us, Lord, to be busy about your work until the trumpet sounds and we go home. Lord, because we want to take a lot of people with us. Thank you for loving us, giving us each other. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to serve you this week, which in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.